Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. My coworker is sleeping. As you can, well, now I just kind of woke him up. But he's very cute. We're going to wait like another minute or so to actually get started. So we can, we can watch the kitten sleep for like an hour because who doesn't, or not an hour, well, a minute. It's very sleepy. Hey, buddy. You're a sleepy kitten. Do, 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 do. Again, we're just waiting for people to hop in. Your rib feels weird. Another minute or so. Stretch, big stretch. It's a big stretch. <clears throat> All right, that's enough of the cap. All right, um, so we are gonna talk about pendulums today, which is another kind of simple harmonic motion. So we're gonna go through a lot of the same stuff we went through yesterday. He's buried himself in a pillow now and it's very cute. Um, so we're going to go through the forces that pendulums go through. We're going to go through um, energy and the kinematics involved with pendulums as well. So just like yesterday, I'll check back every few minutes to see if anybody has questions. If you have a question, you can go ahead and type it in the Q&A um, section. And let's go ahead and get started. OK, so pendulums. You're going to have to excuse my terrible drawing skills. So most likely when we have a pendulum, we're going to have some type of mass hanging on a string of length L from a ceiling. And we're going to displace that mass some initial angle of theta. And that initial angle of theta is usually going to be less than 15 degrees, just because it makes it easier for us to make some assumptions and whatnot. So that angle or that wow pendulum, you know, is going to swing through creating a sort of arc shape until it gets to the other side where it reaches the same exact initial angular displacement and then it comes back. So when we're talking about period of a pendulum, we are thinking about the there and then the back. That is a complete period. Okay. So when we were talking about springs yesterday, the restoring force or the force that pulled us back towards equilibrium, which is this center section here, was the uh, spring force. Okay. Here, the restoring force is going to be a component of gravity. And I'll talk about what component in a second. Okay. The other thing that we might need to look at with pendulums is the circular motion aspect of it. Okay. Because pendulums sweep out this semicircular arc, okay, we are going to need to look at net forces in a centripetal force sort of sense. Okay. So what this means for us is oftentimes during pendulum's motion, we have two accelerations. Okay. We have a tangential acceleration, which makes us go back and forth this way. Okay. And that's tangent to the path. And then we also have a centripetal acceleration, which is directed in towards the center of the circle. And that keeps us moving in that circular path so we don't just move in a straight line. Right. I doubt you would have to do this, but if you needed to find the total acceleration, because these two are perpendicular to each other, you could just Pythagorean theorem both of them and get the total acceleration. Again, I don't think you will need to do that. Okay. 
So we're going to look at forces first. Let's call this our negative amplitude and this our positive amplitude. Okay. Just like yesterday, I'm going to create a chart. Ooh, sound effects where I have a negative amplitude X zero and the positive amplitude. And we're going to look at the forces acting on the pendulum at these specific locations. So at negative A, we look something like this. So if I was to draw a free body diagram acting on the mass, I would have a tension force pulling up like that and a force of gravity pointing straight down. Okay, but those are very clearly in two different directions. And actually this free body diagram should remind you a lot of inclined planes. So we're actually gonna treat this free body diagram almost as if it's on an inclined plane. And with that in mind, we're gonna split FG up into FG parallel, or if you want to call it FGX. So let me draw those in a different um, color. And I'm going to draw them in red to remind you that these should not go on official free body diagrams. So we would have FGX here and FGY here, and those are components of FG. Okay. So the tension force makes an angle of theta with vertical, which means this theta that tension makes with vertical is also the same as that angle down there. Okay, so what this means for us is FGX can be calculated by doing FG sine theta, and FGY can be calculated by doing FG cosine theta. Okay. Now, obviously, this is a little bit more complicated than the springs were yesterday because we now have components and we're not going to really be talking about X and Y direction in the traditional sense. We're going to be talking about X direction or this perpendicular direction and Y direction. Or sorry, this is parallel. We're going to be talking about X in the parallel direction, meaning parallel to the direction of motion and perpendicular or um, the Y direction. Okay. So. The parallel direction is going to res be responsible for that tangential acceleration, meaning what's actually pulling this pendulum bob back and forth. The only force in the parallel direction is this FGX, which is FG sine theta. Okay. So this acceleration, since FG and this M are going to be the same, the acceleration is going to be dependent on the angle. Okay, so at these amplitudes here, we're at theta max, which means that we are at our maximum tangential acceleration, similarly to what we were seeing with springs. Okay, so then we have the perpendicular direction, or you can think of it as a y direction. That direction is responsible for the centripetal force. Okay. Since FT points into the center of the circle, I'm going to call that positive, which means that FGY is negative. Okay, so we have FT minus FG cosine theta is MAC. Okay, now the reason why this direction can't be zero like it might normally be is because we are moving in a circle. So there is a centripetal force. Okay. And keep in mind that whatever force is directed in towards the center of the circle is the larger of the two forces. So in this case, the tangential or the wow, mm, tension force, that's the word. The tension force has to be greater than that FG cosine theta force. So that force and therefore the acceleration centripetally are directed in towards the center. Okay. So I'm going to come back and check for any questions because I know that that was kind of a big complicated one. So I have um, one question that is X always sine and is Y always cosine? That is not always the case. So the reason why we're using sine for X and Y for cosine for Y is based on the triangle we have. So let me redraw the FG triangle a little bit better down here. Okay, so this is FGY and this is FGX. So we know 
the angle that FG makes with FGY. And based on where that angle is, FGX is the opposite side. And we know from SOHCAHTOA that if I'm dealing with opposite and hypotenuse, I need to use sine. So that's why the X direction is sine here. Y direction is adjacent, so that's why it's cosine. In a situation where we have a box being pulled at an angle on a, a surface, since we know the angle with horizontal, the horizontal side or the X side is now the adjacent. So we use cosine there and the Y side is the opposite. So we use sine there. So it's flipped on inclined planes and in situations like that. Okay. Um, and it looks like we don't have any more questions with regards to that first forces one. So let's go ahead and look at the forces at equilibrium. So at equilibrium, this is when we are hanging I might sneeze. Maybe not. Nope. Okay, guess not. Might sneeze later. Uh, so this is when the ball is hanging straight down. And again, this is an active position. We're passing through equilibrium. So we have a tension force and a force of gravity. Okay. Now again, if we think about that parallel and perpendicular motion or direction like we did at the amplitude, we see that there are no forces parallel to the direction of motion, which means the net force parallel is zero here, which means our tangential acceleration is zero. And that's exactly like what we saw with the spring system too. The acceleration is zero as we pass through equilibrium, okay? But the difference here is that we still have that perpendicular direction and we're still moving in a circle so we still have a centripetal force so we're going to have a tension force that's positive because it's pointing into the circle minus an fg is mac and similar to the negative amplitude the tension force this time has to be greater than the entirety of the force of gravity so that the net force is still directed upwards so that this object can still move in a circle. If the tension force was less than or equal to the force of gravity, this object would not continue to move in a circle and you just move in a straight line like that. Okay. So that part isn't too bad. Now the positive amplitude is just going to be pretty much the exact same as the negative amplitude just opposite directions for the forces, okay? So our free body diagram would look something like this, okay? But the equation stays the same and the idea that there's a tangential maximum acceleration and a centripetal acceleration, that part still holds true, okay? So that's pretty much it with regards to forces. Let me check back. Any other questions? It's looking like no. Okay, awesome. So now we're gonna move on to energy, okay? And again, the reason why I like simple harmonic motion is because it does a really great job of reviewing prior units, especially energy conservation. So let's go ahead and talk about energy conservation with pendulums. So, okay, so again, we're going to look at the three major positions, the negative amplitude, the equilibrium position, and the positive amplitude. Okay, so the thing to remember about the amplitudes is even though that they have maximum acceleration at those amplitudes, the pendulum is actually momentarily at rest at those locations because we are changing directions and that changing direction leads to a maximum amplitude. So energy wise, if we have no velocity, then that means we have no kinetic energy. Okay, so that means there has to be some type of energy in our system. And when I talk about our system, we're going to talk about the mass Earth system so that we can include gravitational potential energy. Okay. So at the negative amplitude and the positive amplitude, we actually have 
our maximum gravitational energy because we are at our highest height above the equilibrium position. Right? We can calculate that maximum potential energy by doing MGH. Now, one thing to pay attention to, and I had actually made this mistake going through the um, multiple choice that are going to be due tomorrow, is don't confuse the height of the pendulum with the length of the pendulum. So the length of the pendulum deals with the length of the string. The height that the pendulum is at deals with this tiny height here. I so if you remember, we went through in class how to find that height, but it's a good idea to just kind of write it down. I'm not going to go through the derivation here. So the height is the length of the pendulum times one minus cosine of theta, where theta is the angle with vertical wherever you are. Okay, so this might be a good equation to write down. Um, on your like simple harmonic motion sheet. I don't foresee you needing it, but this way you have it. Okay. Same thing for positive A. We're at our maximum potential energy and we can find our height like that. And you can find your height at any point between negative A and positive A with this equation as long as you know the current angle <clears throat> that the pendulum makes with vertical. So at x equals zero, we're going to assume that this is our zero height. Remember with gravitational potential energy, you can set where the zero height is so it's convenient for you. Usually it's the low point in your system is your zero height. So our lowest point in our system is that equilibrium position. So that's our zero height. If we have zero height, that means we have no gravitational potential energy, which must mean that we are at a maximum kinetic energy, okay, which must mean we are at a maximum speed. Now again, the tricky part is at that equilibrium position, our acceleration is zero, but that doesn't mean anything about the velocity. We have our maximum velocity at equilibrium, even though we have zero acceleration. Okay? So as the pendulum swings back and forth, energy is gonna be conserved. And in these situations, it's only ever going to oscillate or convert back and forth between kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. It's not like yesterday with the vertical springs where sometimes it's in spring potential and sometimes it's kinetic gravitational and potential. So at any point in, time, in between the amplitude and equilibrium, we're going to have both the book. Okay. One thing that's kind of cool and one thing to keep in mind is because gravitational potential energy is directly related to the height. If you're at half the height, then that means you have half the greatest or maximum potential energy. Okay which means that the other half of your energy is maximum kinetic energy. But the thing is, is PE max and KE max are the same. They're their total energy. So at that half height, our energy is perfectly split between kinetic and potential. They have the same value. So let's say our total energy was 40 joules. At the half height point, we would have 20 joules potential. 20 joules kinetic. That's different than spring potential energy where half the displacement does not mean half the energy. It actually means a quarter of the spring potential energy. Okay, so that's one thing that's different with pendulums. The energy is actually a little bit easier to deal with. Okay, let's see if there are any questions. It does not look like there are. Hooray, like I said, this one is pretty easy converting. Um, one, ooh, one thing I do want to talk about real quick. Let's say a question said that you want to double the maximum velocity, okay? One thing to keep in mind is remember we're converting completely between the maximum potential and the maximum kinetic at the amplitudes and equilibriums, okay? A lot of students mistake 
um, the relationship between H and V as being direct, meaning if you double H, you double V, but it is not a direct relationship. H is related to V squared, which means if you want to get 2V, then you need 4H, okay? So the other way of writing this is you could say that V is proportional to the square root of H. So if you want to get 2V, then you need to have a 4 under the radical here because radical 4 is 2, okay? So that's one thing to just keep in mind, even in, for energy in general. Okay. Um, so the last thing we're going to talk about is, whoop, sorry, I had my notes and I flipped the page onto the camera. Okay, no other questions, awesome. The last thing we're going to talk about is the similar graphs that we talked about yesterday, um, position versus time and velocity versus time. They're exactly the same for uh, uh, pendulums as they are for spring systems, right? So if you have position versus time, you should expect to see some sort of trig graph. It might be sine or cosine, depending upon what you see. And that graph is governed by the equation A cosine, 2 pi ft. You could just as easily do A sine, 2 pi ft, if it was a sine graph. It's the same thing. Okay. Remember the slope of this graph gives us information about velocity, both magnitude and direction. So positive slope means positive velocity. Negative slope is going to mean negative velocity. Okay. This point up here would represent the positive amplitude. Zero would represent equilibrium. This point here would represent negative amplitude. So we see that our slope are going to be zero at the amplitudes, which is what we'd expect because that's where the pendulum is momentarily at rest. And we see that our maximum slopes are when we are crossing equilibrium. Again, what we'd expect be because we have our maximum speed as we pass through equilibrium. The last bit of information you can get from a position time graph is the period. You just want to look for one complete trig function. And so the amount of time it takes to complete that one complete trig function is the period. Okay, velocity versus time graphs are going to look similar. Another trig um, graph, again, the slope is going to give us information about acceleration, both the magnitude and the direction. Positive slope means positive acceleration. Negative slope means negative acceleration. And if we know information about the acceleration, then we also know information about the net force and when I'm talking acceleration here I'm talking about that tangential acceleration not the centripetal acceleration okay so where we see these zero slopes here these would correspond to zero amplitude or wow zero acceleration which is where or when we'd be at uh, equilibrium these slopes here where we have maximum slopes would be representative of when the mass was at an amplitude. Okay? Again, we can use this graph to figure out the period of the pendulum. We just need to figure out how long it takes to complete one sine or cosine wave. Okay? And then the last thing we're gonna talk about is the period of a pendulum equation. It's written as TP on the reference table. 2 pi square root of L over G. Okay. Now, big thing to keep in mind is there is no mass in the equation, which means mass does not matter. Okay, Mass does not affect the period of equation or a pendulum. Why? Because it ends up canceling out of both the force equations and it cancels out of the uh, energy equations, right? Like if we set mgh equal to one half mv squared, the mass ends up canceling. Okay. Um, and again, this length is the length of the pendulum, not the height. Don't make the same mistake I did. Okay. Um, if a question asks you to find the frequency 
of a pendulum or a frequency of a spring mass system. Remember that period and frequency are inverses of another. So the frequency is one over the period. So you can use this equation to calculate the period and then get the frequency from there. Or you could just flip everything in this equation. So frequency is one over two pi square root of G over L. And you can do that with the spring equation too. Okay. One relationship to pay attention to in this equation is that T is proportional to the square root of L. So they have a square root relationship, not a direct relationship. So if you double L, you're not going to get twice the periods. You're not getting two times the period. That's incorrect. You will get, however, the square root of two times the period. Okay. So if you want to double the period, so if you want to get double the period, you have to put a number under the radical that gives you a two. The only number that's going to do that is four. Okay, so you have to quadruple the length to get twice the period. Okay. Similarly, if you were to quadruple G, okay, you're not going to get one fourth the period. You're going to get one half the period, which makes sense. If the acceleration due to gravity is larger, you should swing back and forth in less time. Okay. And that is pretty much it for pendulums. Let me see if there are any other questions. Um, so for everything on the exam, your calculator should forever be in degrees, always, which that only gets a little bit confusing because we use radians for angular displacement. Doesn't matter. That's just a different kind of measurement. Calculator wise, always in degrees, always, always. But I don't think you will have much in the way of calculating on this exam. I think it'll just be a lot of like writing and explaining and whatnot because the calculations would be difficult to show you work. If you haven't yet, please make sure you read through the testing guide I sent out earlier this morning. Um, it has some important information about ways to take the exam. Monday is the um, demo test day and that's actually going to be a, an assignment for you guys so you're going to have to go in and essentially take a demo test um i'm going to do it early in the morning so i can kind of get an idea and i'll screen capture it so i can walk for you guys through it too um but make sure you do that that'll be on monday i'll send out the link on monday for that too um and that's pretty much it have a great rest of your day. Thank you for attending. I will see you guys soon, hopefully. Bye.